Imagine a world, not like this one, just slightly off. Grab an everyday object and then take it away. What would happen? Let's take a look at this Jenga. It's composed of several blocks forming a tower. We take away pieces and it becomes unsteady, fragile, and weak, until it falls. Now imagine we did that with the world, our society, or our humanity. What if we took away some elements, building blocks, and distorted them, changed them? Let's say we take away some everyday common things, like books. What if we took away something fundamental, like the ability to give birth, no longer having normal food supplies? What if we take away abstract things, like ideologies, privacy, health, law and order? How would the world look like then? What set of rules would we have? What becomes acceptable and normal? What becomes marginalized and untolerated? Many books have inspired themselves by asking these types of questions. Some have been portrayed cinematically, breathing life to unique worlds. Some are greedy worlds we would never want to live in, where there's constant danger, fear, and persecution. Others are more subtle with the approach. They're almost a utopia. Outwards, they look like something we would want to be a part of one day and hope to achieve as humans. But the utopic beauty is usually superficial and hides a shadowy side of society and of human nature. These worlds are created with a high concept, perhaps by a key event that has changed the world. But these stories are not about the events that created these realities, they're more importantly about how these external factors affect the characters that live in them. This is what dystopian movies explore, by presenting a dark mirror version of the world or by fragmenting it and ultimately distorting it to view humanity under a different lens. They create a context that helps show what human beings are truly made of. It serves as a pressure cooker for human behavior. In this new world, how would we act? What decisions would we take? How would our wants and needs change in the face of these inhuman events? What happens when we strip away the things we thought were necessary for our existence? What's left? What will always be a part of who we are? How much can be taken away before we lose our human identity? Could it ever be lost? And if so, could we ever get it back? Some dystopian movies explore these themes by throwing a wrench to the world and seeing what happens. But other movies are a bit more clinical. They grab a human element and they magnify it and exaggerate it until it becomes absurd. This is something we can see with the movie The Lobster. It's a world that looks much like ours, but the rules of the world render it almost unrecognizable, as if we were seeing a disturbing heightened offsetting parallel universe of ourselves. A world where human relationships are taken to a severe extreme. It is illegal to be single. You must be in a relationship. And it is expected of you to be with your companion at almost all times. Even if you get divorced or your significant other dies, you need to find another mate. You cannot be a loner. If so, you'll be taken to a hotel, where you'll have 45 days to find someone you share a defining characteristic with. If you can't find a companion, well then you'll be turned into an animal of your choosing. These are the rules of the world that our main character David has to follow. His wife has recently left him, and he sees himself forced, without protest, to go to a hotel to avoid a literal dehumanization. Now the interesting thing isn't how this world got to be like this. That's never mentioned, nor is it important to the story. The importance is how these rules affect the world and the people that inhabit it. Now the fact that you'll turn into an animal if you fail to fall in love with someone during your stay here is not something that should upset you or get you down. Just think as an animal, you'll have a second chance to find a companion. We can start by observing how the rules have externally affected the environment and the characters into a coerced uniformity, robbing them of their individuality. The characters, the sets, and the locations are presented to us in a aggressively normal way. It looks like our world, and it's supposed to. The normalcy of the cinematography is deliberate. The minimalist portrayal of this reality serves two purposes. One is to ease us into thinking this is a world we recognize. The second is to make nothing stand out. Everything looks controlled, still, and measured. There's no camera shake. Even the moments of tense action are filmed in a way that looks subdued. The action doesn't leave the frame. Same can be said about the characters. They all wear matching clothing, be it as guests in the hotel, loners in the woods, or as couples in the city. Regardless of physical clothing, they all seem to be walking around with the same layer of loneliness, stitched to their skin. The art direction looks purposely bland, complemented with a drab color palette, all forming a parade of the mundane so nothing gets to stand out. 
This uniformity has even invaded their speech pattern. Have you seen John's leg? No. John, would you show your leg? Oh, yeah. The characters sound the same. There is no cadence in their voice, no emotion behind their words, which is odd since they're usually talking about relationships. They say hello the same way one character can say, I killed your brother. I left him to die very slowly. He may not be dead yet even as we speak. And in the same sentence, Would you like some coffee? I'd love some. It's very blunt and matter of fact. Even when they sing or dance, it's devoid of life. The rules share the same particularity. They try to make everything conform. Is there a bisexual option available? No, sir, this option is no longer available since about last summer due to several operational problems. Hmm. I'm afraid you have to decide right now if you want to be registered as a homosexual or a heterosexual. The rules are made in a way to avoid any gray areas. Even something as trivial as half sizes for shoes is seen as non-conforming. Shoe size, please. 44 and a half. 44 or 45. There are no half sizes. When David escapes to the woods to live as a loner, he seems to have evaded the rigidity of the hotel, but he ends up meeting the extreme opposite, with their own set of rules. Any romantic or sexual relations between loners are not permitted, and any such acts are punished. Is that clear? Can I have a conversation with someone? Of course you can. So long as there is no flirting or anything like that. What happened to your mouth? can't speak. He was given the red kiss. What's the red kiss? We slashed his lips with a razor and the lips of another loner, and we forced him to kiss each other. They were flirting, you know? No matter what David does, he's still stuck in a world where he has to conform to a set of rules, which deny him agency in his life. Now, have you thought of what animal you'd like to be if you end up alone? Yes, a lobster. Why a lobster? Because lobsters live for over 100 years blue-blooded like aristocrats and stay fertile all their lives. We can notice how the rules of the world have managed to affect the characters internally by deforming their humanity, leaving them to be blank canvases defined only by their external traits. There's a particular oddity visible with the characters of the lobster. In other movies, it could be seen as a simple omission or style taken by the writer, but in this case it adds to the efforts of dehumanization. Most characters don't have names, and non-existent are last names. Let's take a look at a paragraph of the script, introducing us to the other guests of the hotel. We see Nosebleed Woman, her best friend, who stares at her, Biscuit Woman, with one hand tied behind her back, Campari Man, Lisping Man, and Heartless Woman, characters we will get to know later. David spreads butter and marmalade on a slice of bread with one hand and eats. Limping Man and Lisping Man come up to his table. Rather than having names, they're defined and reduced to a title or a character trait. This treatment is repeated to almost all the characters regardless of importance to the story, because in this world, that's what matters. The basic defining characteristics are the only way they can find a match and achieve coupledom, so they can fit with the rest of the world. I'm very happy because we have a new couple. They met just two days ago, but they're very much in love and perfectly suited. They both have the same problem with their noses. They bleed quite suddenly. To an extent, it's similar to our world. When we want to get to know someone, we establish things we have in common, sharing the same likes or dislikes in idle everyday things or beliefs. But in this world of the lobster, the director purposely grabs this element in human nature and exaggerates it to a degree where people can only be in a relationship by forcibly having something in common. Something as trivial as having a nice smile, liking butter biscuits or being good with maths, making the bonds between the couples extremely thin and superficial. My mother was left on her own when my father fell in love with a woman who was better at math than she was. She had a postgraduate degree, I think, whereas my mother was only a graduate. My mother entered the hotel but didn't make it and was turned into a wolf. I really missed her. Although not everyone in the hotel has an easy time finding a match, it's like they're all playing an odd game of musical chairs, trying to find someone out of urgency before their time runs out. New guests arrived yesterday? Yes, I saw. I think I saw a woman with a limp. It's just a sprained ankle. She'll be walking normally again in a few days. That's a shame. One of David's friends in the hotel decides to fake chronic nosebleeds just so he can be with someone.
Is it coming out? The limping man opts for self-mutilation to force a physical similarity to the nosebleed woman, while David decides to fake a behavior to form a connection with the heartless woman. The last thing I want right now is a kiss from a silly little girl. Oh. Don't cry, Elizabeth. You should thank me. Now you'll have a limp and be more like your father. The matchup doesn't last long because she quickly finds out that he's been lying about their connection after seeing him cry from killing his brother. Before she gets to tell on him, he manages to tranquilize her and escape to the woods to live as a loner. It's there where he meets the nearsighted woman, someone he truly shares a defining characteristic with. I didn't know you were short-sighted. Do you have astigmatism too? Yes. But since they both live under the same loner rules, they can never be with each other. This is where we get to see David have a sliver of agency. He begins to disregard a set of rules to be with her, someone he's starting to care about. We've developed a code so that we can communicate with each other, even in front of the others, without them knowing what we are saying. The code grew and grew as time went by, and within a few weeks, we could talk about almost anything without even opening our mouths. Although this is tested once the lead loner blinds the nearsighted woman, as a consequence of their relationship. When David finds out, he's distraught, but not so much for her becoming blind, but for them having lost the connection they both shared. She's still the same person emotionally and mentally, but the influence of this world is so strong in these characters that they see the loss of this shared superficial defect as something that handicaps their relationship. They are now uneven. It causes David to hesitate being with the nearsighted woman, but ultimately, his need to be with her pushes him to escape to the city so they can become a couple. Can I have a knife and fork, please? Not a butter knife, a steak knife. Certainly. The interesting thing we can observe is the director is not trying to say something about the characters. This allegorical tale is about what we can find in ourselves. David wants to stay inside of a system to avoid being lonely. This is what drives him, and in the process, he's increasingly disregarding his identity. But that's just an extreme symbol of things we might have a bad habit of doing in our own lives. We don't outright conform to a set of rules, but by osmosis, we end up following them. Have we ever avoided getting out of a relationship because of what other people might say? Or to simply avoid being alone? Have we ever feigned interest just to have something in common with a person we liked? Have we moved in with someone, gotten married or had children just because it was the natural next step that was expected of us? Of course, these aren't groundbreaking examples, but they do show we can willingly give away parts of our individuality without the help of earth-shattering events or strict invasive dictatorships. As we see David struggle with gouging his eyes out, he's weighing two things in a balance. One, risking not conforming and breaking free from the suffocating uniformity. Or, option two, stabbing his eyes out, following blindly with the rules of the world, dehumanizing himself out of the fear of being alone. This is a story that's meant to provoke us. These unemotional blank characters are made to create an emotion in us, to make us question the everyday human behaviors we set upon ourselves. What do these characters have to say about us? Do we willingly give away our own identity?